Hey everybody, thank you for joining our podcast, Moms on the Move. I'm Jen Wells. I wanted to start this podcast by making an announcement. Um, Ashley Staggerwald obviously is not here, and I just wanted to let everybody know that she has decided to take on more of her you know, personal um, work and focus on Boy Scouts work, her family, and so no hard feelings, but she is not going to be doing the podcast with me, unfortunately. So I am um, very grateful to her for the past year and having her sit with me and do this. I think it went great, and I'm excited to continue, but I did make the decision to continue. So we are still here today. I have life coach Jennifer Sisk sitting here with me and Dr. Heather Gill with Wellness for the Mind. Mm -hmm. So both our prior guests, um, Jennifer Sisk, <laughs> you prefer Jennifer? Jennifer Sisk is um, my co-host. So thank you for thank doing you. this with me. I am so excited to be I know, here. I know. I'm really excited. I know. She's so excited, and I'm so grateful for that excitement. Um, but we have Dr. Heather Gill here again. So you were here a few Good weeks morning. ago. I was. And we like we talked about mental health and. Depression. Depression. A lot about depression. Adolescence, mm -hmm. mostly. We did. And then we went on a tailspin after the show about mm -hmm. stress. Mm -hmm. And you were like, you know what? We need to do this on the show. Absolutely. Because everyone is stressed. Everyone. It is yeah. part of being a human. Yeah. Yeah. So what does that look like physically? So I, absolutely. So when I work with my families and clients and adolescents, I say to them, um, you know, what is stress, mm -hmm. right? Because we all talk about it and we all use mm -hmm. that word. We use we it so- We always say we're stressed. Mm -hmm. We always say we're stressed and we understand that. Like we realize like we're, we feel off. We just mm -hmm. don't feel like we're on our game. Um, but really what I try to explain to most of my clients is stress is anytime something basically places more demand on us than we feel like we can handle, mm -hmm. right? So one day I could be driving down Woodruff Road and I'm like, I've got this, right? Right. Five days later, I could be driving down Woodruff Road and be like, I can't handle this. And so it really is very unique to each individual and also how much we already have on our plate, right? And we use that word a lot. And so when we talk about stress, a lot of times we talk about stress ors like traffic, flying, you know, if people have, you know, stress over homework, if they have stress over social situations. But when most people are talking about stress, they're talking about how they're feeling, right? Mm -hmm. When people say, I'm really stressed, Yes, we talk about the event that caused us stress, but we're really like, I don't feel right. Like something feels like anxious. Yes, yeah, something mm -hmm. feels off for me. So I think the question you led with is perfect. Um, the body keeps the score, mm -hmm. always. Um, the body always keeps the score with stress. And what I think is really important when I talk to my clients is it's normal, right? Yeah. We have had a limbic system for years. Um, one of the best models I've ever seen is by Dr. Dan Siegel. He wrote the ba um, he wrote two books, The Whole Brain Child and Brainstorm. And Brainstorm is excellent because it's about adolescent brain growth mm -hmm. and why it's so stormy. Um, so I'll show you our little hand model. And it's really yeah. unique and it's so easy. And so I have fun when I work with my kids and my teenagers. I'm like, this is kind of your brain. If anyone's listening, she's making a fist. Yep, <laughs> I'm making a fist and I'm like, this is really cool. Like if I could like put that in there, that would be in my brain. And what we talk about is like the lower part of your brain. And this is over oversimplified from a mm -hmm. neuroscience standpoint. It's just to give kids some reference points. Yeah. But the lower part of your brain is where like that limbic system is and your amygdala. And that is for bear attack mode. You know, if you're out hiking and you see a bear and I, I joke with the kids in my office, I'm like, if we're sitting here and a bear jumps through that window, what are we going to do? And they're like, kind of run. I'm like, absolutely. You're not going to sit here and say, are you a panda bear? Are you a brown bear? Are right. you a grizzly bear? We have that limbic system for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, then the reason Dan Siegel has like the thumb basically tucked in under his fingers is because this is your prefrontal cortex. And that is this part of your brain that is under major renovation from, we say basically 12 to 24. And that's the part of the brain that's like, hmm, how do I okay, I'm in Woodruff Road traffic, but it's okay, I'm gonna be on time. Or yes, I have chemistry and calculus homework and English homework, but how do I prioritize, prioritize it? Mm -hmm. So that I feel like it's not like everything is overwhelming. But what happens is this part of the brain, basically they say we flip our lid when we go into fight or flight. Ah. So what happens is when our kids 
teenagers, young adults are struggling and they're stressed out. And we're like, hey, it's okay. Let's just come up with a strategy. Hey, let's just come up with a list. You're trying to talk to this part of the brain. It's not available. Wow, okay. Right, because once you go into the limbic system, your body is coursing with adrenaline and cortisol and it's preparing you to fight or flee, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I'll talk in a bit, there's more than fight, flight, flee. What about adults? It happens to us too. So we're still. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Yeah. And then this happens on a day-to-day basis, right? And so um, you might be running late to an appointment and there's road work and there's construction and you kind of feel it in your body, right? Now, it the doesn't... rage. Yes, you kind of just, your body reacts to it. The body's amazing. I always say the limbic system is not bad, mm-hmm. right? I always say you have to lean into your limbic system. It's trying to tell you something. It's very intelligent. Yeah. It's trying to tell you hey, something's not right here. Some Maybe you don't have the tools on board to handle it. Yes, you're feeling overwhelmed with your homework. Let's take a step back from it and see if we can get the prefrontal cortex back on board so that we can be like, ooh, calculus is due tomorrow, but English is due Friday. So instead of like reacting, you're logically thinking through. You're trying to basically calm down the limbic system, mm-hmm. like, hey, it's okay, and bring on your prefrontal cortex. Yeah. So much easier said than done, though. Yeah. Um, because we all go through fight, flight, freeze. Um, and it, I think about it when I work with my adolescent clients, like it can be um, nobody talked to them at lunch, or the people they normally talk to in between classes weren't talking to them, and then their brain just goes into this like limbic system survival mode, mm-hmm. because we're meant to be social beings. We're meant to be, we're tribal. We're supposed to be in villages and communities. So that's a big stressor for adolescents and right. teenagers. Right. So, and that's a really, and that's, that's a very oversimplified you know, um, model, but on a day-to-day basis, I don't know many of us that go through our day without some surges of our stress response. Right. Right? Yeah. It's a part of being alive. Yeah. <laughs> right. It right. is. It yeah. Is. And yeah. I think most of us are like, no, 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 no. And they, we, we think it's bad. And when we feel it in our body, we think it's bad. But it's really there to teach us something. And especially if we really are in danger. You know, if a car is coming mm-hmm. down the road head on towards us, we're not going to take the time to be like, is that car a foot from us, an inch from us, a millimeter mm-hmm. from us? Like, we're going to do what we need to do. And that's where I'm like, you have to lean into that limbic system because it really is trying to help you. Right. That doesn't mean you feel good, though. Right. So a lot of my clients will come in and they're stressed out. Um, what I will ask them is, where do you feel it in your body? Yeah. Because you always will feel it in your body. Absolutely. Always. Yeah, because it's either, you know, your stomach. Yes. Headaches. Or in, yeah. in, in panic attacks. Panic attacks. Yep. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> a little aside, we have this fun little 10th cranial nerve called the vagus nerve. And there's a lot of theories out there, polyvagal theories. But basically, the 10th cranial nerve is one of the longest nerves in our body. It goes from the brain to the belly to the heart to the lungs. That is the nerve that after we are in a stress response is supposed to calm us back down, right? So once we're, like, if we've just almost had, like, a collision on Woodruff Road, if we've, you know, just realized we didn't study for the right quiz or we didn't realize there was a quiz today and we're sitting there in math class and our body is, you know, we've got that whole body reaction, you want to use tools that will basically keep your vagus nerve toned so that you have a quicker response time and you basically can get over that stress response faster. Wow. Yeah. We need a day at burn boot camp. Strengthening that always vagus so nerve. Movement good. is always good. I have a question. When <laughs> yes. You've talked about the external things a lot that I deal with with my clients. Right. is an internal anxiety. Yes. Where they have, and it's a lot of it is from fear. It fear is. of the unknown. It is. And so it's not always... You know, a car or, the or a curveball, somebody, right? right? It's uh, it's generated within. It is generated. So, within. what are your thoughts on that? So, a lot of times when I talk to my clients, I will ask them, "Where is this coming from?" Right. So, you're right. Like it may be a quiz or a calculus test, but the internal fear is, "I'm going to fail. I'm not good enough. I'm going to disappoint my family." Mm-hmm. Right. So, when you, I always say, you have to peel some layers back. Right. Um, I talk a lot with my clients about transitions and curveballs. A lot of my clients will come in, like a classic is the parents forget to tell them they have a, a session with me. Mm-hmm. And so they pick them up from school and the whole way there, they're arguing because they're like, you didn't tell me I had a session with her. It's not that they didn't want to come in. They didn't have that in their mind for the day. That wasn't in 
all of the different sequences that they had planned for the day. And so we will talk about, well, what does that mean? You know, well, you know, I wasn't ready for the session. What if I don't know what to talk about today? You know, I don't like curveballs. Well, why don't you like curveballs? Well, because I'm, I feel like I'm going to fail. So there is that internal piece. So when you can peel the layer back, right? Like, so being stuck in traffic, right? For most people, they don't want to be late because they don't want to seem like they're not hardworking, that they're not, you know, diligent, that they're mm-hmm. not, you know, credible. Right. Right. So yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Or giving an excuse again. You know, right. And you're, yeah. and it's, you're like, it's like my reputation. Like it's mm-hmm. my, you know, it's who I am. I don't want to look like I don't care. I don't, you know, so there's a lot of those internal dialogues, but most people talk about the external, right? The traffic, the quiz. But I always say, what's at the root of that? Mm-hmm. Right. What's your and internal fears? What is it? Right. What is your fear? You know, what are you telling yourself? Are you telling yourself, oh my gosh, here we go again. I'm a failure again. My parents are going to be mad at me again because I'm not good enough. I will say the not good enough story plays a lot into, you know, our stressors. Mm-hmm. Um, but there always is. So I, for me to adapt tools to my clients, once we kind of peel the layers back and figure out, like, what is the real story about this? Is this, you know, nobody cares about me? You know, my mom didn't care enough to tell me I had an appointment today. Like, what is it really about? But then I will say to them, where do you feel it in your body, Mm -hmm. right? And so it manifests in a lot of different ways. Most people can say they know where they feel it in their body, right? But I do have some clients that are like, I don't know where I feel it in my body. And that self-awareness, we have to really start to foster that because they don't know. Mm -hmm. And so some of them, it's the jaw and they hold their jaw really tight or their shoulders. And so they're walking around with like, you know, shoulders as earrings all the time. And they just, and they don't know it. Um, A lot of people... It's like a throat chest thing. Like I have some clients that will come in and we start talking about it. They're like, I'm having a hard time talking. And so their throat gets really tight. Ah. Um, The chest is very common. A lot of people will be like, I feel like my chest is tight. I feel like I can't breathe. I feel like my heart is racing. Um, That's scary. Oh, it's so scary. That's yeah, another layer. Yeah, think something else is it's right. so wrong. scary. Oh, right. absolutely. Yes. And if I have right. if I have clients who have a really active imagination that at fourteen they think they've got cancer or they've mm-hmm. got, you know, they they mm-hmm. I've had clients come in and they're like, I, I know I've got cancer, and I'm like, all right, well, let's talk about that. So let's peel some layers back. Where is mm-hmm. this coming from? Because they don't always know that the body reactions are very normal for us, like this. And we have those reactions for a reason, right? So if I am being chased by a bear, Mm -hmm. or if I'm sitting in my office and some crazy bear tries to like, you know, jump through the window, I'm supposed to have my heart rate up so I can run. I'm supposed to have my lungs just pumping oxygen through me. I'm not supposed to be digesting food, right? Right. But I'm not 99% point nine percent of the time we're not in real danger right we're not being chased it's by protection what does chronic right. stress though do you so chronic stress so what happens is that's the whole point of the vagus nerve when mm-hmm. people recognize that if your vagus nerve is well toned and i'll talk about like there's a lot of things between movement and breathing and nature and meditation okay. and singing and dancing and everybody's different the diver's response you know putting your face in cold water everybody's different ah. in terms of what tools get them to tone the vagus nerve. And I explained to them, it doesn't mean that it's gone. You're not gonna go from a 10 out of a 10 to a zero by doing the diver's response or by going for a walk or Mm -hmm. walking out in nature, but you are going to feel like, I have some control over this. Like a reset too. Yeah, yeah, you can be like, okay, I've got this. I don't like the fact that I didn't know about my calculus quiz, you know? And so, but I'm gonna go in the bathroom and splash water on my face and, I might be now at a seven. Like if I scale at zero to 10, they're not at a 10 anymore, but they might be at a seven. Mm -hmm. And I always say to them, you're not gonna go from 10 to zero, but your goal is to feel like I've got this, the vagus nerve is doing its job, which is basically stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system to be like, hey, we're not in danger anymore. Okay, the heart rate can go back to its normal rate. The lungs can go back. Hey, belly, you can digest food now, right? Um, stomach issues are huge, especially in this past year. I have had so many clients with stomach issues mm-hmm. because of the unknown with the pandemic, the depression That's that me. came along with it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I always say the, the belly is a great, it, it's an intelligent part of our body, right? And the vagus nerve is connected to the gut anyways. Mm-hmm. So if you're starting to have like a lot of acid reflux or you just, mm-hmm. your stomach is really off, yes, you can look at food and stuff, but if it's something that seems to be unusual, start looking at what's going on in your life. And sometimes if we walk back up, we find out that we have been ruminating on homework, 
ruminating on relationships. We lay down at night when we go to bed and our mind is just chattering yeah. at us. You know, what have you done wrong? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I said this today to my friends. I hope tomorrow when this happens, I have a better response. And we just sit there ruminating. It's called our default mode. Mm-hmm. It's meant to protect us, but it sometimes chatters a lot in more of a negative realm. Yeah. So it's that, like our tummies, I've always said, is our God given <coughs> compass, our gut. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's our God given compass. They'll call it our second brain so, sometimes, too. Yeah. yeah. So you yeah. help them become self aware because once you're yes. self aware and you can recognize what's going on, yes. then you have a little more control and right. you know how to handle it right. and you know, and you can feel it coming. Yes. It doesn't come out of nowhere and just, yes. you know. Yes. I always say once you can, I, I always say once you see it, you can't unsee it. You know, I, I joke about it with my teenagers. I'm like, you know, if you see something on TikTok that's really gross, once you see it, you can't unsee mm-hmm. it, right? And I'm like, same thing. Like, once you know this, you can't unknow it. The hardest part, I think, for most of us is that we don't always practice what we need to practice. And so so when I start working with my clients, I will say to them, where do you feel it in your body? So for a lot of them, if they have a lot of muscle tension, um, especially with younger teenagers that might still, like, knock over chairs or, you know, if they're fighting with their parents and they knock stuff off the table – they clearly need a physical outlet, Mm -hmm. right? And so I will say to them, your body already is telling me that when it reaches that adrenaline and cortisol and you're in basically that sympathetic fight or flight, you need a physical activity. And it can be something so simple as push, if you're in the classroom and you use proprioception, you can push against that chair and you can engage your muscles and people that just, they just think you're stretching, right? You can push, you can twist. I'm like, if you're in class and you can't go out in the hallway and drop and do push-ups, or you can't go run a lap, there are tiny little things that will let you feel like you're still in control. And then after class gets out, maybe you go and go outside and get some fresh air. Or I have some teachers that will let the kids go outside and do wall push-ups. They do push-ups against the wall wow. for kids who really are physical. Yeah, and that too. If you get to that That's point, awesome. they're like, mm-hmm. they really need to get that physical activity out. Mm-hmm. But then I'll have some that, um, it's in the throat and they have a hard time talking. Um, And so sometimes cold water, ice cold water, and that's kind of that diver's response. So Mm -hmm. it's that they call it the diver's response because when you get into ice cold water and you're diving, you can't go into panic mode when you're like hundreds of feet below the surface, but the body kind of knows you're hundreds of feet below the surface in the brain. So it's this weird response where like you're like, oh my gosh, I'm 100 and 200 feet below the surface, but the brain's like, but you can't panic. Right, wow. the cold water. There's this. I mean, we have a lot of stuff that goes on that we don't have to think about. Our mm-hmm. heart beating, our hair growing, right? And the well, brain yeah. does know to kind of take over. And so, I will have some clients put their face in ice cold water. And if they're in class, I'm like, just take yourself ice water. And if you think in any way, shape, or form, you're going to start to feel that constriction. That ice cold water has a very soothing effect. So the body reads it as kind of a calming effect. So that's for some people, that may that not be calming. That is, that is really so neat. good. Yeah. But some people, about, that may not calm them, right? Some people, that, yeah, yeah, so yeah. everybody's different. Everyone's different. Right? different. Yeah. So What about um, breathing? And, and, yes. and another thing I want to touch on, too, is I've been told, even with my own therapist and who mm-hmm. I got certified mm-hmm. by, that um, your brain can only do one thing at a time, yes. the multitask is still doing things in a, in a row. It still is. It's like they're millisecond, millisecond, millisecond. But, right. but it can really only focus on one thing. Yes. So when you start to panic or things start yes. to happen, um, breathing. Yes. Your breathing gets shallow. Yes, so it does. So I, you know, tell me what your thoughts are on breathing in, holding, yes. breathing out. Yes. Because you literally, you have less oxygen to you the have brain, less oxygen right? To the brain. When it gets shallow. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. So I would say that's my number one tool. So all of my clients, I will say to them, and I have them sign something that asks if they're open to meditation and breathing. And meditation doesn't have to be sitting in a yoga position, ohm. It can be walking meditation. It can be sitting in your car and breathing and having a mantra that's like, I breathe in calm, I breathe out peace. You know, I, I, mm-hmm. I, I mm-hmm. adopt it to whatever they feel works for them. But I will, across the board, teach my clients breathing because the amount of research is just piles. Like, I would say wow. for the last 20 years. And now that we can image the brain, so we can see when somebody does deep breathing, we can see on an fMRI or a QEEG how it affects the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala. We can actually see that in real time but I can just put a blood pressure cuff on you. That's, oh, that's all amazing. I have to do. Wow. I mean, yeah. I can just put a blood pressure so cuff on you. So how long do you always tell people to do the breath? So sometimes I have folks that have lived in such an elevated stress response that 
when they breathe with me, they panic because they've never really felt the full expansion of their lungs. So I remember a client that I have, I currently have her, but I remember the first time she was dealing with panic attacks and OCD. And I was like, all right, let's breathe together. And she was like, I can't. And I was like, well, talk to me about that. She goes, I can't catch my breath. And so I was like, all right, let's just do an in-breath. So I have them expel all their air. And I'm like, give me an in-breath. And she was like, (gasps) and that was it. She couldn't Mm -hmm. even, I usually say three counts in with a really pleasant pause at the top because it's like you're on a wave and then five counts out. I mean, ideally, your exhale should be two counts longer mm-hmm. because watch my inhale. It's ramping me up. It's yep. tightening me up, right? But my exhale, that's your parasympathetic nervous system. So I try to teach that to all of my clients. I will have some at first that are like, I can't do it. I had one. She was Her tics were really bad. We were talking about some trauma. And I was like, do you mind if we take a break? And do you mind if we just do, let's just do 10 breaths together. She's like, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. I'm like, it may not. Right. But let's just try it. She did not have one tick during those 10 breaths together. Not one. Wow. And when she opened her eyes back up, she was like, wow. And I was like, it is with you all the time. Mm-hmm. You don't have to take it with you. You don't have to get permission to breathe. You don't have to get permission to put a water bottle on, on your desk or a stress ball in your hand. It's with you all the time. Yeah. So when should parents feel more worried than seeing their kids like the normal stress sure when is it the next level that's a really good question um part of it is some kids are just more i say wired um, but they're just more worriers like they Mm -hmm. came into the world that way like um i have one of those in you know my family um i i I came into the world that way so so i think you kind of need to know your Your child child, because if you've had a child that really doesn't get that stressed out and then all of a sudden you see that they're having panic attacks, that needs to be looked at. Yep. But if you have a child who has always been a worrier and has always been cautious and they tend to, you know, I say melt down, but they have those breathing episodes where they're like, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that may be more of their normal, right? Yep. Um, so I would say knowing your child, knowing is this unusual for them, but if they always have been cautious and slow to warm up and need a little more time to transition, then that's kind of their normal. It's probably never bad to have somebody help them with tools. Right. But if you have a a teenager or a child that pretty much has been easygoing, free-spirited, whatever, and then, bam, they're starting to, like, have panic attacks, my stomach hurts all the time, I can't go to school, that's an unusual, Mm -hmm. you know, set of symptoms for them. And that's where, I mean, as parents, sitting down with them, if you have, I always say, I said this when I was here before, like, Always try to have a relationship with your child because you're the one that sees them the most. Like you want to be their trusted person. You want them to talk to you. So if right. you sit down with them and you're like, this seems so unusual for you, you want them to trust that they can talk to you. Um, and sometimes parents handle it very well on their own. They're like, hey, you know, I do deep breathing. Do you want to do that with me? Or, hey, I really notice sometimes when you're frustrated, you flee more, you run outside. Do you like to be outside? Does that help you to go outside mm-hmm. and breathe in fresh air? But if you find that what you are trying to do doesn't get them where they need to be, then that's when you may reach out and say, hey, let's have somebody coach you. Mm-hmm. So. so you have the breathing, the physical, mm-hmm. the water. So I would say like for people that are like heart rate mm-hmm. and breathing, that's where the deep breathing and um, there's a lot of, I mean, it's all over the internet now. I mean, you can find so many different folks that will teach you like the diaphragmatic therapeutic breathing. Um, I mean, if you can only get two counts in, try to have four counts for your exhale. If you can get three counts in, try to get five out. So funny how simple that is. And it even is grounding. So simple. grounding. It is so simple, you, but it's they, inter- they tell you to mm-hmm. put your feet in the yes, grass yes. or the oh, sand, yes. grounding. Yes. For a lot of people, looking, exactly, senses. exactly. Mm-hmm. I was at a workshop two summers ago and we talked a lot about the value it's called forest bathing or um japan like i think i said this yeah before. you did yeah doctors will prescribe it's called shinrin yoku it's like forest bathing it's like forest therapy it's like ecotherapy and it's people who have a when they are stressed out they can feel that they're more in control and they can feel their prefrontal cortex come back on when they're in nature whether they're mm-hmm. you know a a local park it doesn't have you don't have to go to the mountains if you can great but if you're like i just want to go outside and stand in the grass in my bare feet 
Yeah. You know, I always tell people it doesn't really matter what other people use. It has to work for you. For you. It just can't right. be immoral and it's unethical. Personal. What about right. those like weighted blankets? <laughs> those are great. Um, <laughs> some people love them and some people feel claustrophobic in them. Okay. So um, I always tell clients if I have kids that are really panicky at night and they can't mm-hmm. go to sleep and they feel exposed or vulnerable, um, you know, either they will pack like, you know, cushions and blankets around them. But yeah. I have some that just love their weighted blankets. And so, again, that's where it comes down to. It's always catered to what your need is, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's really, and I have some kids that the weighted blankets, you know, are their best friend. Yeah. Right. What about those oils? You know, like Essential lavender. Oils? Again, yeah. I think that really it just is, depends on the person. The senses. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. My mother-in-law always sends me lavender. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's unique. So it's a really I feel like the world of like psychology and mental wellness is amazing right now because there's not just a one-stop shop. I have a lot of clients who will um, see folks for like crystals and they really mm-hmm. like, you know, using different like, you Your know, crystals. like, you know, <laughs> like they like and they feel grounded with them. Um, yeah. Some folks really, they walk around with their lavender oil and, you know, or they'll go and meet with folks at Pure on Main and come up with some type of, you know, oil blend that works for them. Have you been there? Mm-hmm. I've heard the best things it's about great. that place. It's fabulous. Yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah. So we'll need to go. Yep. Yeah. Need to make a trip. It's I know, great. I know. And so I think for, well, I would say for all of us as humans, we all know what grounds us and we all know what doesn't ground us. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes we do what everybody else does and it's not right. So like some people, if I told them to go for a run, it would ramp them up more. Right. Other people would go for a run and they're like, oh, I feel like the That's weight me. has been lifted yeah. off of me. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but I will say this, um, we used to know that there were three responses to the stress response and it was fight, flight, flee. There's been a lot of research done, I would say in the last decade by a lot of your, um, neuropsychologists, um, immuno neuropsychologists and all this. And what we have found is there's two other aspects to our stress response. And so you've got your fight, flight, freeze you've got social connection and challenge. Mm -hmm. And what they're finding is that a lot of times when we're stressed out, what do we do? We call our friends, Mm -hmm. we call our spouses, we call loved ones. We want to talk about it. Call your life coaches. Right. You call call somebody or you talk to them or you text them and you're just like, I need to get this out. And there is a lot of value in getting it out and hearing yourself getting it out. And sometimes that is enough to bring you back down so that your prefrontal cortex comes back on board. Yes, so, you do. You leave some that, of it that with is, the person. To me, right. that is so And you challenge helpful. the thought when right. you do that. You're right. challenging what you're saying right. and you're right. leaving a little bit of it right. with the person. Mm-hmm. There's some excellent studies. Um, one of my favorite books about stress right now is um, The Upside of Stress. It's an easy read. It's by Dr. Kelly McGonigal. She did, she works at Stanford and she does amazing studies on our stress response and she will say she has got a, she's got an awesome TED talk so if you want to just like look at a YouTube Kelly McGonigal yeah. TED talk she will say in there I have to be honest like my initial research in stress I am actually debunking it like we used to all say stress is bad stay away from stress avoid mm-hmm. stress and she's like but that's not possible no what we're not. finding is that stress can actually be good. So I will ask my clients, do you think stress is bad? And honestly, most of them will say no. Like, mm-hmm. I think we're getting there as a as humanity. We're like, no, I think we have to have some stress. So yeah. I'm always surprised when I'm like, do you think stress is bad? And they're like, well, no, because I guess stress helps me do better in school and helps yeah, me practice true. my lines mm-hmm. for my play. But she has done some amazing studies. Um, and they're all throughout her book, but she will have her like students at Stanford sign up to be participants in one of her classes, and she will separate them out, and I'm gonna just oversimplify, but group A and group B. And group A is told, you're gonna be taking a math test, it's gonna be counted towards your grade, it's gonna be harder than anything you've ever learned, you are probably gonna really struggle at it, it's gonna be hard, good luck. They go Mm -hmm. take the test, and at the end, they draw their blood. So they've all agreed to have their blood drawn. Yeah. Group B, they're told, hey, you're going to be taking a math test. It is going to be on the level of math that you know, but that's okay. We want you to challenge yourself. Critically, critically think through it. Maybe you'll recognize some problems that you've done before and see if you can extrapolate and pull that information to these. We don't want you to stress out about it. You are going to be graded on it, but that's okay. We're really looking to see if you can handle the challenge. And 
And can you kind of be creative, you know, when you're facing something that you don't know what you're going to, you know, be looking at? Right. They go through, take the test, have their blood drawn. They say that both groups have like elevated cortisol, Mm -hmm. but the group A lacks DHEA, which is a growth hormone. Group B has DHEA. And so they actually, your blood can't lie. Your blood shows that you actually have a growth response to that. And you're only told. And and, sorry, this is super basic. Growth response in what way? Like what? Instead of going in and being like, oh my gosh, this is the end of me. This is going to make me fail this class. This group was like, okay, it may be hard and I may not get the grade I'm going to get, but they didn't go into such an elevated cortisol adrenaline that it basically overshadowed any type of growth. DHEA is a growth hormone. Okay. And a growth hormone basically just allows you to recover quicker oh, from stressful events. Okay. Okay. Right? Wow. So oh, it's deep. it's just, I mean, it allows us to just regenerate faster. Mm-hmm. It allows us to recover quicker. Like the vagus nerve? Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I saw it, yeah. you, you, not having the background you do, positive versus negative. That's mm-hmm. how I felt when you right. were saying that. Right. You know, negative, positive. Right. right. And how that feels. And that's, and I think that is really important. So when I work with a lot of teenagers who have a lot of anxiety about, you know, how they're going to do at school, how they're going to do if they have to do a presentation, if they have to do a group project, I will say to them, Let's look at this as a challenge response. Let's not, and I will say, let you know, we can fight, flight, you know, we can freeze. Mm-hmm. But is that going to teach you how to sit with that discomfort? Mm-hmm. I'm like, you can run out of the room and go to the bathroom. You know, you can not do the project, but it still hasn't taught you what you need to know. And so can we shift our mindset to, all right, this is going to be a challenge for me, but I can do this. What are my tools? I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have a mantra before mm-hmm. I go in that's like, make sure you slow down when you talk, or I'm gonna have my cold water with me, or I'm gonna do ten breaths beforehand. And so I will say to them, we're humans and we don't get to avoid discomfort. We just don't. There is no right absolutely no way. You can drink yourself all day long, you're still gonna feel discomfort. You can run out of the classroom and avoid every presentation. At some point in time, you're still gonna have to face that discomfort. So can we shift our lenses from stress is bad and I'm going to like absolutely pass out on the floor from a panic attack Mm -hmm. or do we say I'm human and I have the tools I may not like this it may not be comfortable for me but I have the tools I want to challenge myself because I'm going to grow from this what would you say pressure from parents with that study that just kind of like showed me a little bit if you put too much pressure right Right. D- d- you know, does that elevate? Right. Them? So I used to do a lot of parent coaching. I don't do as much now, but I used to probably for about a decade did a good bit of parent coaching, bringing in like love and logic and neuroscience and a lot of Dan mm-hmm. Siegel stuff with the whole brain child. And so um, like it's a big difference between if your child just like hauled off and whacked their brother, you have to have consequences and be more <laughs> firm. my life right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's but if your child is you know, struggling with their homework and they're not able to like keep up in school. I don't know a kid that wants to fail school. I've never met a kid that wants to just bomb their homework. Typically speaking, when they're struggling, it's because there's a disconnect. Either Mm -hmm. their learning style doesn't match what they're being taught. Maybe the information is more than they can handle. Maybe they don't have good organizational skills. So when I talk to parents, I'm like, let's, let's meet that child where they're at. And so then it's more of a strategic problem solving conversation versus a pressuring conversation Mm -hmm. but there are i i mean i see clients often that it's grades it's grades it's not what they learn it's grades and so i have some that get to college and are burned out before they get to college Mm -hmm. yeah because they have been or sports yes i mean both of those yeah right yeah right Right. so like they don't even continue to play through high school because they're burned out so we need to do another podcast on just like how to parent Without screwing them up. <laughs> That's a big podcast. Because no, there's not a manual. Yeah, we need there's help. There's no manual. It's crazy. It's so hard. <laughs> I always feel like, you know, every kid is different, and then you want to do the best for each right. one that's going to look different, and then right. it looks like it's a little unfair if you're right. harder on this one, not right. as hard on this one. It's, it's and complicated. I, I will, and I will tell mm-hmm. parents, I'm like, you have to parent the child you have. So just because your one child gets braces, you don't put the other two in braces just Correct. because your first child gets braces. Or... If one needs glasses, you're like, all right, we're going to be equal. You all get glasses, right? So I always use kind of silly analogies like that. I'm like, your parents really have to do their job of making, you know, they have to discriminate between 
who needs what at what time. And so Mm -hmm. one kid might need more help on homework where the other kid doesn't. One kid might need to have, you know, extra tutoring or whatever because of their organizational skills and another kid may not. And Mm -hmm. so it would be silly if we put them all in glasses and braces at the same time. I love that analogy. That is really good. I had a neat question or it's kind of stepping outside of things, but you know, when people, um, they always have a dramatic life or they're always harried. Yes. Um, can it be a wiring where you have been in st- stressed out for so long yes. that you continue to possibly create it? Yes. And mm-hmm. so all day it's there. You can't yes. get away from it. And it's it's uh, it's something you've, you can't get out of because you don't know anything different. This yes. is where you've lived. Right. And you don't know what it feels like to be on the other side of it. So you can create it or it's just internal. Right. Or What are your thoughts on that? So two things. One is if somebody has been through significant trauma, that has a huge influence on them feeling like they're on guard a lot. So if it's, you know, um, growing up in an abusive home, physically, emotionally, sexually abusive, that's a big, you know. It's it's rooted. Yeah, right, because because they did live constantly on guard. And so our brain wires, you know, our brain is so neuroplastic and it can – constantly shift shift and change like we could all move to Russia and learn Russian we might not think we could but we could Mm -hmm. we can also learn maladaptive coping right so if we're constantly in a situation that is abusive or if we've been assaulted or um, you know if we were completely demeaned demoralized in a job whatever it may be or if we're in a relationship like that you're going to constantly be waiting because you're walking on eggshells so that's a like a whole different group, that's a whole yeah. different conversation where you're dealing with folks who've been traumatized and their stress responses constantly because the body is trying to protect them. So it's not actually bad. Like yeah. I tell people, the reason you do these things is because your body is so intelligent that it knew it had to do these things to keep you safe in the right. trauma you were living through. But I also think we live in a world where we talk about stress and I fall prey to this, like especially when I'm throwing a lot of curveballs and a lot of transitions or things that I wasn't expecting you know, the mind gets into this, like, I can't handle this. This is more than I can handle. And so I think a big piece of it is what is the story you're telling yourself? And that is something I have to work on. And this is, I've done this for 25 years, but when a lot of stuff comes down the pike and you're like not expecting it and you're, you're already creating the story Mm -hmm. in your mind, this is going to be a horrible day, an awful day. This is the most stressful day of my life. Can you take a step back and ask yourself, okay, yes, I have a kid that's homesick from school. How do we handle this? Can we grow from this? Okay, yes, I've got to reschedule some clients. Is this what I really want to do? Not really. This is kind of stressful. I don't really have time for this, but can we find a way to reschedule them? Yes, right? And so I think part Mm -hmm. of it is how, like you had said this earlier, how do we grow from it, right? If we're constantly the victim Mm -hmm. of our circumstances, which I think we all fall prey to that. Like, I know Mm -hmm. there are days where I'm like, oh my gosh, how much more can I take? But if I can step out of my own fight or flight and be like, wait a minute, I'm not a victim to this. Like, I'm a human. Mm-hmm. And, and humans are going to have days that don't go well. And especially the way we live now, it's definitely not as laid back. It's not as, like you say, like it's multitasking things right after another. It's not like we're just going out to plow the fields and that's my day, right? right. So I think we forget that we have these stories and these stories really do work against us. So I actually have a lot of folks journal that I'm like, Write down throughout the day, My what are your just stories? started doing this, and she said it right. changed her life. It's I, one of the most important things you yeah. can do. Wow. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think two things. One is um, a lot of times we go through our day really ungrateful for all of the beautiful relationships or experiences or opportunities that happen because if one or two bad things happen, we don't see the others. It overshadows, yeah. So um, my partners and I are doing this right now. We're doing gratitude journals every day. Like something so simple as, you know, I got to talk to you in the hallway today and it was really neat to see you. Or I got to see the stars out this morning when I went for a walk. And just making sure that we don't get so caught up in that default mode, Mm -hmm. which our default mode is meant to be like, are we safe? Like, that's from our thousands and thousands of years of, you know, development. We go back to that a lot. And it's, we don't think about it because it's our default mode. And so we have to work really hard to get out of that hairy, dramatic phase. So I always say a gratitude journal feels really good. And you just write down things that you're like, this was really nice today. This is, I'm really grateful for. The Mm -hmm. traffic was really light today. You know, a person let me out, you know, in Woodruff Road today. Like, it doesn't have to be 
earth shattering. Right. But the other journaling that I do with a lot of my clients who have victim stories or their mind bullies them a lot, our mind can bully us a lot. Like you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that, that you didn't get picked first for, you know, volleyball today is to take the journal and write a little bit about what's stressing you out or what you feel went wrong Mm -hmm. and then pull it full circle. How can I grow from this? Oh, well maybe, and maybe it wasn't personal that they didn't pick me first, you know? Maybe it was just because that's the person she looked to her left and that's the person she saw, right? But pulling the journal full circle so that you're like, okay, I don't really want to hardwire into my brain a victim mindset, so how Mm -hmm. do I see where there's some growth with the discomfort I felt today or the stress I felt today. Yeah. So, but otherwise it gets really easy to get caught up in the default mode of like, you know, of course that person cut me off. Of course, you know, like everything got canceled today. Of course my kid's home from school sick today. Right. <laughs> right. I think so. I was there a few weeks ago. <laughs> well, when I you're already all been stressed. There. Yeah. <laughs> when you're already stressed <laughs> and then it's like everything else in the rest of your day is exaggerated. <laughs> yeah. It's exaggerated. Yeah, it's just, it's okay, exaggerated. Everything just keeps happening. Every light turns yes. red, yes. you know. And even the best of us. Mm-hmm. I mean, I go to workshops where I work with people who are like the researchers in this and they're the ones that write the book on it. And it's kind of fun to talk to them. Like I have a really good friend that she writes books on healing. And when we talk, I'm like, it's so nice to know that we all, even though we know the science of it and we coach people and we help others, that we know we're human too, too. Yeah. right? And I think it's really good to be human and say, I will tell my clients, I'm like, I so get you. Like Mm -hmm. I'm a worrier. Like I know what that's like. Here's, you know, here's the different things that we use to help people with worry or yeah, I don't like curveballs either. So right. here are the tools that help. But I think you have to recognize that we're all going to be our basic humanness, which is we're going to get stressed out when things don't go our way. It's not because we're bratty. It's just because I didn't expect that curveball, mm-hmm. right? And initially we're like, <gasps> what do we do? Yeah. What do we do? And once we can feel it in our body, we can be like, oh, I'm in my stress response. Wait a minute. Okay, what do I want to do? Can I pull over for five minutes and breathe? Can I get some ice and just kind of chew on it? Can I step out of my car and just like see some you know like landscape and just kind of calm myself Mm -hmm. can i sing and turn the music on yeah i have clients singing is like so therapeutic yeah dancing well thank you so so much i feel like i'm just sitting in between two very smart women (laughs) i love it i think you bring a lot here too (laughs) i have learned so much i know this will help me with my clients this is incredible (laughs) next time we'll switch and then you can teach me (laughs) yes because i have those days where i'm like do i know what i'm doing today (laughs) but that's being human. No, this is so helpful. I'm I'm very grateful we talked about this. You're so, so welcome. thanks for joining us again. You're thanks for co-hosting Thank with me, lady. I loved it. It's awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. I learned so much. Thank you. So where can everyone find you? So um, I I have a private practice. It's called Wellness for the Mind, and you can just Google Wellness yep. for the Mind. That's Dr. Heather Gill. That's that's who I am. Yeah. It's just wellnessforthemind.com. It's really easy. So that's how you find me. Great. Well, thank you again. You're so welcome. Um, thank you. And I just want to say one more time, um, thank you, Ashley Staggerwald, for do- doing this journey with me for the past year. And um, I miss you, and I'm excited to continue on with this podcast. So thank you, for everybody, for your continued support, and I'm excited for what's coming. Thank you to the sponsors who are sticking by. I want to thank Lisa Johnson, um, Nest Realty, my new brokerage. I want to thank Body Works, a new sponsor, Parmsmith, Arch and Hold, and Black Acre. So thanks again, everyone. And if you have any topics you want to hear, I would love to hear from you. Have a good one. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.